This little essay from Paul Feyerabend appears in The Owl of Minerva, Philosophers on Philosophy, which was uh, published in 1975, uh, edited by Charles J. Bontempo and S. Jack Odell. Let's make more movies. In the first scene of Brecht's Life of Galileo, Galileo uses a short demonstration to convince the boy Andrea of the relativity of motion. In scene seven, he repeats the point for a learned cardinal. In scene nine, he refutes some of Aristotle's views on floating bodies by a simple and elegant experiment. When realised on the stage, these brief episodes make us acquainted with some features of a scientific debate. A few more examples and we might know how to argue in similar cases, but they also show how people behave when engaged in argument, how their behaviour influences the life of others and what role such influence plays in society. Presented swiftly, concisely and forcefully, the episodes impose upon us an interesting and uncomfortable conflict. Having been trained by our teachers and by the pressure of professions and by the general climate of a liberal scientific age to listen to reason, we quite automatically abstract from external circumstances and concentrate on the logic of a demonstration. A good play, on the other hand, does not permit us to overlook faces, gestures, or what one, what one might call the physio physiognomy of an argument. A good play uses the physical manifestations of reason to irritate our senses and disturb our feelings so that they get in the way of a smooth and objective appraisal. It tempts us to judge an event by the interplay of all the agencies that cause its occurrence. Even better, a good play does not merely tempt us, it deflects us from our intention to use rational criteria only. It gives the material manifestations of the idea business a chance of making an impression. And it, is, and it thus forces us to judge reason rather than use it as a basis for judging everything else. Let us see how this works in a special case. Brecht's Galileo is not a professional. The fact that he has ideas and can support them by argument is the least important thing about him. What interests the writer is that Galileo is a new type of thinker, that he is a man rather than a trained scientist. He is virile, sensual, impetus, impetuous, aggressive, extremely curious, almost a voyeur, a glutton physically and intellectually and a born showman. When the curtain rises, we see him half naked enjoying morning bath, breakfast, astronomical conversation, all at the same time. Thinking is for him a joyful and libidinous activity. The play of his hands in his pockets that accompanies it and expresses its emotional nature approaches the limits of the obscene. This is the man who explains Copernicus to Andrea in an offhand manner. And without trying to drive the point home, he simply leaves the boy alone with his thoughts. He leaves him alone not because of lack of interest, for Andrea, despite his youth and despite his ignorance, is treated as an equal. Nor is the collaboration enforced. It is the natural result of a charming friendship between a vigorous scholar and an intelligent, inquisitive and headstrong boy. Thought, so it seems, has left university and monastery and has become part of everyday life. This is the situation Brecht wants to discuss. The situation is not unambiguous. We are not merely shown a new form of life. We are also shown some of its internal contradictions and the problems to which they lead. For example, Galileo is fond of certain phrases, 
gestures. He uses them frequently and occasionally with an air of self-righteousness. Andrea repeats them, though less imaginatively and much more rigidly. When the situation seems to get out of control, when the discoveries of his master are in danger of being pushed aside, then all he can do is describe them with raised voice. In the end, he turns out to be a somewhat unintelligent and slightly unstable Puritan. Could it be that relaxed collaboration creates slaves more readily than does the usual te teacher-pupil interaction with its emphasis on training and domination? Galileo's daughter, who wants to participate in what seems to be such an entertaining life, is cruelly rejected. This is not a toy. So the new knowledge business that announces itself with the nude Galileo in scene one is not accessible to everyone, nor is it free from stereotype. The distinction between those who play in the correct fashion and those who do not is driven home when Galileo confronts Mucius, who has gone his own way. He sees him with his pupils, crowd, with his pupils crowded behind him like a pack of unsure dogs. The dogs not only protect their master, they also want to be fed and amused. And Galileo, who, do, who does not always come up to their rather narrow moral expectations, resorts to tricks to keep them interested and loyal, to suppress their discontent. The tricks he produces are important scientific demonstrations. They are essential parts of what we call in retrospect the scientific revolution. They are full of deep insight and they are performed with an elegance and ease that makes them veritable works of art. Yet their origin now almost seems to be the wish to dominate, not by physical power, not by fear, but by the much more subtle and vicious power of truth and their function to satisfy the intellectual greed of his followers and to tie them closer to him. Politicians need new wars and scientists new discoveries to, protect, to prevent their soldiers from becoming discontented. It is quite true. Research has ceased to be a purely contemplative process. It has become part of the physical world. It has started to influence people in new ways. It has established new relations between them. But instead of becoming an instrument of liberation as well, it creates new needs which are as insatiable as the needs of a sexual pervert. Galileo refers to his unsatisfied drive to do research in the very same manner in which an arrested sex maniac might refer to his glands. Even the happiness of his daughter, her whole life, counts little when it conf con conflicts with the urge to know. In the play, this aspect of the new science is explained by Galileo's political failure. Research goes on afterward. The results are more splendid than ever. They are still revolutionary from the point of view of mechanics and astronomy, but they have lost their chance to reform society for a long time to come. Knowledge is a secret for professionals again. The content has changed. The form remains. This is what the story tells us. In addition, it shows that this particular aspect was present from the beginning and thus exhibits the contradictory nature of every historical event. So far, a brief and very incomplete sketch of the working of a tiny part of a complex and colourful machinery. What can we learn from it? The problem that appears in the play is one of the most important philosophical problems. It is the problem of the role of reason in society and in our private lives, and of the changes which reason undergoes in the course of history. What happens when strange and ethereal entity such as thought that has eternal laws of its own and makes submission to the, these laws a condition of rationality, knowledge, progress, even of humanity, takes up residence in the physical universe and starts directing the lives of men? Are the consequences always desirable 
and what changes should be carried out if they are not. On the stage, the problem is not dealt with in a purely conceptual manner. It is shown as much as it is explained. This is anything but a disadvantage. Philosophical discussion has often been criticised for being too abstract, and one has demanded that the analysis of concepts such as reason, thought, knowledge, etc. be tied to concrete examples. Now, concrete examples are circumstances which guide the application of a term and give content to the corresp corresponding concept. The theatre not only provides such circumstances, it also arranges them in a way that inhibits the facile progression of abstractions and forces us to reconsider the most familiar conceptual connections. Also, the business of speculation, which occasionally seems to swallow everything else, is here set off from a rich and changing visual background that reveals its limitations and helps us to judge it as a whole. Today, an interesting visual point arises from the fact that businessmen, philosophers, scientists, scientists and hired killers all dress alike and have comparable professional standards. But the briefcase in the hands of these pillars of democracy may contain a contract, a thesis, a new calculation of the S matrix or a sub submachine gun. It is, of course, possible to present the additional elements in words, but only at the expense of regarding our problem as solved before we have started examining it. For we now simply assume that everything can be translated into the medium of ideas. We have to conclude, then, that there are better ways of dealing with philosophical problems than verbal exchange, written discourse, and a fortiori scholarly research. This result was well known at a time when philosophy was still close enough to the arts and to myth to be able to avoid the trap of intellectualism. Plato's objections to writing his use uh, Plato's objections to writing, his use of dialogue as a means of bringing in apparently extraneous material, his frequent changes of style, his refusal to develop a precise and standardised language, a jargon, and above all, his appeal to myth in places where a modern philosopher would expect a scintillating culmination of argumentative skill. All these features show that he was aware of the limitations of a purely conceptual approach. Earlier societies and some non-industrial cultures of today have overcome these limitations in a different way not by trying to rebuild emotions, gestures, physical phenomena in the medium of language, but by making them part of the basic ideology. This ideology represents the entire cosmos and it uses all the resources of society, architecture, thought, dance, music, dreams, drama, medicine, education, even the most pedestrian activity in the process. Philosophy, however, chose to restrict itself to the word. This restriction was soon followed by others. Plato's attempt to create an art form that could be used to talk about reason and to show its clash with the world of appearances was not continued. Technical terminology, standardised arguments replaced his colourful and imprecise language the treaties replaced the dialogue. The development of ideas became the only topic. For a while, one tried to construct comprehensive conceptual systems and used them for evaluating the relative merits of institutions, professions, results. There was a hierarchy of professions. Each individual subject received meaning from the total structure and provided a content for it. The hierarchy fell apart with the demand for autonomy that arose in the 15th and 16th centuries and became orthodoxy with the arrival of modern science. Even philosophy was broken up into various disciplines with special problems that had little relation to each other. Was its quality improved? It was not, as is shown by the history of one of its more desiccated parts. 
the philosophy of science. <clears throat> the scientific revolution of the 16th <clears throat> and 17th centuries does not yet suffer from the effects of specialization. Science and philosophy are still closely related. Philosophy is used to expose and to remove the hardened dogma of the schools, and it plays a most important role in the arguments about the Copernican system, in the development of optics, and in the construction of a non-Aristotelian dynamics. Almost every work of Galileo, the real Galileo and not Breck's invention, is a mixture of philosophical, mathematical, physical, psychological ideas which collaborate without giving the impression of incoherence. This is the heroic time of the philosophy of science. It is not content just to mirror a science that develops independently of it, nor is it so distant as to deal with alternative philosophies only. It builds science and defends it against resistance and explains its consequences. Now, it is interesting to see how this active and critical enterprise is gradually re replaced by a more conservative creed that has technical problems of its own and how there arises a new subject that accompanies science and comments on it, but refrains from interfering. The development is occasionally interrupted by a vigorous and irrepressible thinker such as Ernst Mack, who sets his ideas against the well-established mechanical worldview of the 19th century and who wants to change science, not just to increase its efficiency, but also to preserve freedom of thought. His suggestions are taken up by scientists and philosophers. The former use them in the Galilean manner to awaken science from its dogmatic slumber and to turn it upside down. The result in philosophy is a new conformism. In the beginning, this conformism has all the appearances of a great revolution. Metaphysical philosophies are criticised, sneered at, or simply pushed aside. Weak speculation in the sciences is triumphantly exposed, not without considerable help from the scientists themselves. Advances in logic are turned into formidable machines of war. But now, after all this initial commotion has subsided, what remains? There remains a subject whose professed aim is to explicate science, which means we are not supposed to change science, but to make it clearer. The call for clarity is raised without any attention to the problems of the scientist. Satisfaction of the demands of a particular school philosophy, namely logical empiricism, is deemed sufficient. What we have here is therefore a double conformism. Both science and logical empiricism are to be preserved and explication is the machinery that does the dirty work. Only this machinery soon gets entangled with itself. Paradox of confirmation, counterfactuals, grew. So that the main problem is now its own survival and not the embalming of science and of positivism. That this struggle for survival is interesting to watch, I am the last one to deny. What I do deny is that physics or biology or psychology or even philosophy can profit from participating in it. It is much more likely that they will be retarded. They will be retarded because of the naive simplicity of the philosopher's approach and because of its mistaken urge for precision. After all, we are not only interested in whether a given methodology solves problems that appear when certain simple logical models are used, or whether it agrees with the principles of a popular ideology such as logical empiricism. We also want to know whether it has a point of attack in the knowledge we possess, and that means in the imperfect, internally inconsistent, unfinished, vague, incoherent, ambiguous theories facts we happen to accept at a certain time, and how we can improve this knowledge in the complex physical, psychological, social conditions in which science finds itself. A logically perfect set of rules may have disastrous consequences when applied in practice.
a logically perfect idea of dancing may cause recurrent cramps, or what is more likely, it may turn out to be absolutely useless. Such a judgment can of course be obtained only by putting philosophy in a wider context and by combining methodological speculation with historical inquiry. This was done not so long ago, and the results are amazing. Science violates all the conditions which logical empiricists pretend to have abstracted from it, and the attempt to enforce the conditions would wipe it out without putting anything comparable in its place. The separation of science and the philosophy of science has indeed become complete. What is the remedy? In the case of science versus the philosophy of science, the remedy is obvious. What is needed is a philosophy that does not just comment from the outside, but participates in the process of science itself. There must not be any boundary line between science and philosophy, nor should one be content with an increase in efficiency, truth content, empirical content, or what have you. All these things count little when compared with a happy and well-rounded life. We need a philosophy that gives man the power and the motivation to make science more civilised, rather than permitting a super-efficient, super-true, but otherwise barbaric science to debase man. Such a philosophy must show and examine all the consequences of a particular form of life, including those which cannot be presented in words. Thus, there must not be any boundary between philosophy and the rest of human life either. We must rid ourselves of the restriction to words, treatises and scholarship that has shaped philosophy for now well over 2,000 years. We must try to revive mythical ways of presentation, and we must also try to adapt them to contemporary needs and resources. This brings us back to the problems at the beginning of the essay. One of the characteristics of ancient myth is that the elements which it uses to represent the cosmos and the role of man in it are arranged to increase the stability of the whole. Each part is related to each other part in a way that guarantees the eternal survival of the society and of the state of mind it represents. This is not always an advantage. We want to improve the quality of life and we want to be able to see where improvement is needed. Now discontent arises only where parts are in conflict, on, in conflict with each other. For example, when, when one's wishes and emotions are found to conflict with external reality. New ideas arise when the possibility of such a conflict is not excluded. A comprehensive system of presentation is prog potentially progressive only when its parts can be set against each other. And parts can be set against each other only when they have first been separated from the whole and permitted to live their own lives. The separation of subjects that is such a pronounced characteristic of modern philosophy is therefore not altogether undesirable. It is a step on the way to a more satisfactory type of myth. What is needed to proceed further is not the return to harmony and stability as so many critics of the status quo, Marxists included, seem to think but a form of life in which the constituents of older myths, theories, books, images, emotions, sounds, institutions, enter an interacting but antagonistic elements, enter as interacting but antagonistic elements. Brecht's theatre was an attempt to create such a form of life. He did not entirely succeed. I suggest we try movies instead. One of the advantages of film is that the number of the elements which are at the disposal of the director and their degrees of freedom are vastly greater than in any other medium. On the stage, it is impossible to separate colour and object and to show their effects independently. The film can overcome this difficulty. 
On the stage, it is impossible to separate expression from the presence of a human body. The film can overcome this impossibility. On the stage, it is impossible to show how a character is put together piece by piece until a strong and vigorous individual stands before us. The film can overcome this impossibility. Of course, the impossibilities of the theatre I have just described are a matter of degree and they are not absolute. I shall never forget how Eckhart Scholl, step by step, transformed the character of Arturo Yui. Each step was such was each step was a superb exercise in slapstick. The intermediate results were utterly laughable, until out of their mere accumulation there suddenly emerged a hideous shape of an incre of incredible political force. The theatre is much richer than the average critic is inclined to think. But the film still adds to it without losing its achievements. It can show the transformation of faces, operation, makeup, mimicking, in addition to the transformation of bodies. It can show the effects of distance in space, time and context. It can move from stage or book into life and back again into stage and book and so on. Of course, it will need a new generation of thinking directors to exploit all the possibilities of this medium, but their rise will be the beginning of mythologies that will continue the work of the older philosophers and put an end to the strange business that has lived off their results in the last few centuries. <laughs>